and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And today I want to talk about Johnny Wirtz's Grand Conspiracy, in particular, the type of writing that Wirtz has employed. With all of these books, one of the things that consistently has impressed me is how Wirtz uses language like a scalpel. People often talk about you must be concise. And they conflate that with, it must be short. You shouldn't use adjectives. You shouldn't use adverbs. But concision is actually all about maximum amount of information conveyed with the shortest number of words or the smallest number of words. And so when we talk about concision and precision in writing, Wurtz's writing is phenomenal. Um, and it's a style that I particularly enjoy. Now, of course, not everyone is going to enjoy the style. But I thought if you're interested in reading fantasy, epic fantasy, an epic fantasy series, Wurtz's The Wars of Light and Shadow, the uh, final book is actually out this year, uh, coming out very soon. And so this is an, a Decalogue, an 11 book series. And I've just picked a very short section from uh, Grand Conspiracy, because I want to talk about some of the elements here in the writing. I want to talk about how Wirtz utilizes the writing to convey things to the reader, but also ensures that the reader is kept up to speed with the most important elements. Now, if you're worried about spoilers, this isn't going to spoil anything for you. I'm just looking at the writing and there are no big plot points or anything like that that are given away here. But I thought this is an opportunity to talk about the different styles of writing. Dakar snapped awake, gasping and soaked in runnels of terrified sweat. He could not reorient. The palm fronds and blue sky over his head seemed a jumble of meaningless color. For an interval, he squeezed his eyes shut and trembled, raw dread like the tang of flake rust on his tongue. Something had just gone terribly amiss. His spurious gift of prescience never touched him like this, nor left him with the hollow, used feeling of a discarded old boot. The nausea that racked him carried a taint, as if the violating fingers of a spell had just tickled the length of his aura. So I'm going to stop here, and hopefully you can hear me over the beautiful but intrusive bird song. This is obviously a section from a book, and I have not given you the, pre the preceding section. But from it, you know immediately what happened in the preceding section. Dakar snapped awake from that from those three words, you know he was asleep, okay? Gasping and soaked in runnels of terrified sweat. So he's snapped awake. It's a, uh, an immediate movement of coming awake very, very quickly, but also violently snapped awake, gasping and soaked in runnels of terrified sweat. So he's woken up in a sweat, but the sweat is of fear. And it's not just fear, it's extreme fear, terror. He could not reorient. He is confused. He is disoriented. So he could not reorient is pointing out a lack. So rather than he was disoriented, which is giving you a statement of what is happening and his position, he could not reorient is telling us that he is trying to, re, uh, to get his bearings, but can't. The palm fronds and blue sky over his head seemed a jumble of meaningless color. So palm fronds and blue sky, we're immediately thinking tropical location uh, and a nice contrast of the, the green and the blue. But it seemed a jumble of meaningless color. So that is reinforcing the disorientation that he is feeling. For an interval, he squeezed his eyes shut 
and trembled, raw dread like the tang of flake rust on his tongue. For an interval, so this is not for a second, for a split second, it's an indeterminate amount of time. So it's actually locked into or very close to the position of Dakar's awareness because you have that when you're disoriented, you don't know how much time is passing. You just know that some time has passed. And so it, it, might, it might seem to stick out using the term interval, which is not something we expect in a lot of epic fantasy, but it actually works here instead of saying for an indeterminate amount of time. It's a much more concise way of conveying that very specific aspect of what is trying to be put across. He squeezed his eyes shut and trembled. So we know he is covered in sweat. He is disoriented. And so he closes his eyes, but it's not just closed, squeezes. So you get that feeling of effort because for an interval, he closed his eyes. You know, great. So he closed his eyes. But squeezing his eyes shut actually gives you a sense of the effort that he is going to and trembled. So he is shaking. So he's not just gasping. He's not just covered in terrified sweat, but he is trembling. He is shaking. He is shuddering. Raw dread, like the tang of flaked rust on his tongue. I think we've all experienced that sort of bitter taste that you sometimes get with adrenaline. And this idea of the flake rust on his tongue, having that tang, that metallic tang, is not only getting across that bitterness of adrenaline that spikes with fear, with dread, with a lot of different emotions, but because flake rust is kind of that orangey red color, it's also suggestive of blood biting your tongue, feeling, tasting blood in your mouth. So even though it's not saying that, there's a, an implication of that, that taste, that tang, that iron metallicness that goes with blood. Something had just gone terribly amiss. So this is Dakar realizing that something is wrong. So here, seriously, birds? So here we have one of the things about linking into a point of view. Dakar snapped awake, he's confused, he doesn't know what's going on, and we slowly get this sense of Dakar piecing things together. So now that the, he's disoriented, he's trying to figure things out, something had just gone terribly amiss. He knows something is wrong. He's just come into wakefulness in a very specific moment, in a very short amount of time. Something had just gone terribly amiss. We are tracking Dakar's thought process as he is trying to reorient himself, as he is trying to understand where he is, what is happening, what has just happened. His spurious gift of prescience never touched him like this, nor left him with the hollow used feeling of a discarded old boot. So why spurious gift? something that uh, is not really a gift, that it has a cost. So the use of the term spurious here is actually a really nice way to undercut the concept of gift, this gift of foresight that he has, his ability to predict the future, but it comes with a terrible cost. And so spurious gift gets that across with a single additional word. That is concise writing. Never touched him like this. So even though this dreadful gift that he has has a cost, what has just happened is out of the ordinary even for this. It doesn't affect him this way. So he knows that something is actually wrong. It reinforces that previous line, something had just gone terribly amiss, nor left him with the hollow used feeling of a discarded old boot. So now we're getting the sense of uh, the feeling and aftermath of this is making him feel used and making him feel used badly. And that is implying 
someone manipulated him. Someone manipulated his gift and did it in a way that was careless as to how he would feel, react, or how it would affect him. That is all communicated in the left him with the hollow used feeling of a discarded old boot. The nausea that racked him carried a taint, as if the violating fingers of a spell had just tickled the length of his aura. So the nausea for readers in the series, the nausea is something he expects. But this time there is a taint to it. There is an infection, something different about it. It's not the usual nausea. And this taint suggests an element of poisoning, um, of an additional uh, chemical or something to it that is subtle, but shifts it. It's almost like when you look at a puddle of water and it has that she uh, faint sheen on the top of a tiny drop of oil or gasoline, where you see that rainbow tint across the top of it. It hasn't polluted all of the water, but something in it is wrong, is disturbed, is not natural. That's what this kind of is, is conveying, as if the violating fingers of a spell. So the use of violating here is really doubling down on something went wrong. It was done by someone else and it was done by magic, the violating fingers of a spell, but violating that reinforces being used like an old boot, that this is um, something done to him, not with him, not for him, done to him. And it is a violation. It is bad. It is something that just the use of that one word gives you a sense of intrusion and imposition and of boundaries being crossed, violating, and it's fingers of a spell. So it's not even that this is a, someone had grasped him and done all these things. It's much more insidious than that had just tickled the length of his aura. And that seems almost incongruous, tickled the length. That doesn't seem really, really bad. But what we have here is this Im imposition of an external force that is leaving this taint as it is subtly trying to manipulate him. And so we have this feeling of violation because he has discovered this. Another chill swept him, an instinct chased by fear, let him suspect that someone powerful had meddled with his gifted prescience. So this is immediately consolidating all of that information from the previous paragraph. He is chilled even though he's apparently sleeping beneath a palm frond and blue sky in some sort of tropical re region. He feels chilled and that unnatural chill, that shudder, that someone walked over your grave, that can happen and you feel ill, unto untoward, un uh, unbalanced. An instinct chased by fear let him suspect that someone powerful had meddled with his gifted pre uh, prescience. So he suspects this. All of these feelings he is trying to sort through in his head. We know he is disoriented and he is slowly piecing it together. And this instinct of feeling used no, uh, lets him know that someone powerful has meddled with him that has set off this thing. And because of that, the what was implied in the previous paragraph is being consolidated. So even if you hadn't picked up on all the detail in the previous paragraph, it is being communicated here. Wurtz is being very careful to ensure that the most important information is made clear and overt to the reader without, without distancing the narration from the point of view, trying to keep that point of view located in how Dakar is feeling. So there's a balance between Dakar's thoughts and what he's feeling and his perspective, but also ensuring that the reader has this information about what has just happened. But we also get, it's an instinctive response, 
and it's a fear response and suspect. So that ominous nature of fear, instinct, and suspect, all of those things place the idea that someone powerful who has meddled, this is all negative. This is something to be feared. This is something bad. All of that is, is communicated in this word choice. The unnatural acidic fragments of his dream stayed lodged in his memory like impressions stamped in smoke and sulfur. So unnatural. He has a gift. This gift is not always convenient for him and certainly has a cost, but it is a natural gift. What he has just experienced is unnatural, is artificial, it has been manipulated. So again, the use of unnatural here is fitting with why this particular prescient dream feels different, how he knows something is different. And then acidic fragments of his dream, these are burning into him. And very rarely do we, we refer to, the, oh, that's acidic, that's lovely. Acidic has a very negative connotation here. Acidic fragments, they are burning into his mind, into his memory. And they are lodged. Uh, these fragments of his dream stay lodged in his memory. That this is not he remembered. It's almost, again, an imposition of these things being artificially jammed in there. Stamped in smoke and sulfur. This suggests, again, one of the things, demonic, something bad. Sulfur does not smell good. Smoke it generally doesn't smell good. That this is something burnt into his mind. Acidic fragments, smoke and sulfur. That we get really negative impressions of this. A spell seal based on forced mastery would impose such unpleasantness. So forced mastery. So again, that violence coming in and unpleasantness. So he is slowly working through and piecing together from his impressions, from how this uh, particular repercussion from his prescient dream is different from normal. He is slowly working through and piecing together who did this to him who possibly could do this to him. So we're actually following a nice, clear logic in his thought process. We have gone from him waking up suddenly, being confused about where he is, then paying attention, something has gone wrong, then slowly working through this and the feeling of being used, and then analyzing, well, that use, well, it feels like a spell, then... Well, if it was a spell, it must have been someone powerful. If it was someone powerful, what sort of person was this? And paying attention to how the unnatural acidic fragments of his dream, he then starts puzzling out. It must have been a spell seal based on forced mastery. Because that would have caused this. And then distinguishes it from a different way of doing it, not a working drawn from the fellowship's craft laid down in harmony with the major balance. So here again, we have the, the different aspects of magic being referred to and him thinking about this and saying, if it had been done in the type of magic he's used to, this idea of the major balance and the fellowship's craft, it wouldn't have felt this way. It wouldn't have been imposed this way. Therefore, it, it feels far more like forced mastery. So an attentive reader is going to go, I know exactly who that is. The rare intervention sent by Ath's adepts would be gentle. A feather touch channeled from the prime source that anchored the weave of the firmament. And so even though he suspects one form of magic, he then goes through the next form of magic, goes, it can't be that. And then he thinks of the third form and goes, it cannot be that. We see the process of elimination. This isn't just, it must have been those people. We are again following Dakar's thought 
as he works through this. And as he works through this, he is essentially answering the questions that a reader might have. The reader's going, well, how do you know it's that type of magic and not that type of magic? And as a practitioner, he's going through and describing how these different magics feel and how they are used and how that is reflective of the people that use them. So Aths Adepts, these priests, because of what they do, it would be a feather touch and it would feel much more gentle and therefore natural because it's from the prime source that created this world that they are all about working in harmony, which is also similar to, but slightly different to, the fellowship's craft, which again is emphasizing balance and harmony. And in order to dictate that someone must do that, in order to dictate to Dakar to have this prescient dream without his permission, that is excluding the fellowship and Ath's adepts. And it's leaving one very particular way of interpreting who did this to him. Now, I've included the, the next sort of section, but what I want to do here is to talk a little bit about, because this is just a continuation, you can read it if you wish, but to talk a little bit about how the, the vocalization of the, the chapter by using Dakar as the point of view we see the difference in what is going on and how perception shapes the reality. So someone enters the scene and makes a, a comment that Dakar is annoyed. Then Dakar flinched and looked up to find Arathon Safalan standing over him. So even though we can guess, if you're familiar with the books, who has said this to uh, Dakar, we get confirmation. So again, Wurtz is ensuring that people are identified in a scene for the reader. Because if it was completely locked into Dakar's view, Dakar wouldn't sort of describe, oh, Arathon is looking at me because it would be automatic. He would automatically recognize it. But we see that Dakar is trying to push Arathon away and trying to hide what just happened. We then get this description of Arathon giving us an up-to-date view of what he looks like now because time has passed. But I wanted to, to point to the last two sections here. Dakar clamped his jaw through another wretched spasm. He racked his churned thoughts for some telling rejoinder that would send the Cephalon prince safely packing. Too late, the green eyes now fixed on his face. In a tone very changed, the shadow master said, Dakar, for mercy, what's wrong? What I like here and what I wanted to talk about was Dakar has just experienced this terribly invasive, horrible thing. He is disoriented. He is in fear. He knows this is bad. Something bad has just happened. But his first instinct is to protect Arathon from it, because he knows if Arathon finds this out, Arathon will act. And Dakar does not want him to act. There are all these things being implied. So even though he clamped his jaw through another wretched spasm, he is still feeling these devastating physical effects. He is still thinking about how to protect Arathon. And none of it is spelled out despite the fact that Dakar was physically uh, feeling like crap, he really wanted to protect the Cephalon prince. So one of the interesting things here is Arathon Cephalon is given as the identification of the character, then it's Arathon. And as it moves down through, we then get Cephalon prince. So very quickly in that, we have gotten a number of Arathon's different names we find out Arathon Cephalon, his full name. Then it's Arathon. So it's located in, that's another way to refer to him. Uh, it's his first name. Then the Cephalon Prince. So now we have the additional information that he's a prince. And then at the very last, the Shadow Master said. And so now we get another one of his titles. 
So through this, through this variation in the names being given, it clearly identifies Arathon, it catches the reader up into all of these different ways of referring to him, and it gives us a sense of who Arathon is, all these different elements. But interestingly, it starts with Arathon, Cephalon, and Arathon being the one who is kind of making fun of Dakar and poking fun at him and, you know, oh, you're, you're being silly lying under the, the thick because he is unaware that Dakar has just suffered something terrible. But once he realizes that something terrible has happened, we now get this change of his title to the Shadow Master, that this is a title of authority, a title of power, a title that is slightly different to referring to him just as the person. And it's a subtle shift, but it's interesting and telling that the powerful persona is the thing referenced when he questions Dakar very specifically about this and is trying to find out something that is plot related. But I wanted to highlight one last thing here. He racked his churned thoughts for some telling rejoinder that would send this fallen prince safely packing. Safely packing is slightly, well, I wouldn't, well, odd, um, because we think of it as quite a modern expression. But when we think about it in the context of the journeying that these characters are doing, and we realize that, yeah, you pack to go on a journey. This is a much older phrase than we typically expect. And there's something called the, the Tiffany problem, where older expressions, because we are more familiar with them in a modern context, we forget that they are older expressions. And we think, oh, that's too modern. It shouldn't fit there, when really they, they are perfectly fitting. But again, he wants to send the prince away without the prince finding out what's going on. And it was just, it was interesting because you have telling rejoinder. Again, quite an archaic expression, but because safely packing seems so modern, there seems to be that disconnect. And I just thought it was, it was quite nice and cute and sort of went to that idea of the perception a reader can have when we are unfamiliar with the history of expressions. But the major thing that I wanted to talk about here was, again, this use of balancing the point of view, linking it very tightly to Dakar's perspective, showing how Dakar is working through all of these things. And then the shift in his thoughts away from his own personal misery and feeling of being violated to his desire to protect, even in a gruff way, Arathon. And that is reflective of Dakar's character. He is gruff. He, he is, at times, coarse. And he isn't particularly subtle. But his heart is in the right place, whether or not we agree with his actions or why he does things. But we know he is doing it from a genuine perspective, a genuine attempt to do the right thing, to be good. And so although it isn't spelled out, we worked through his thought process as he is trying to understand what just happened to him and then try to understand who did it to him and how he tracked all the way through that. And then the scene moves on from that internal consideration to the external consideration of Arathon arriving and realizing he needs to protect Arathon from that. And what is so amusing about this is someone did something to him, manipulated him, caused him to have a prescient attack, and he feels violated because his agency has been denied. And yet he does exactly the same thing or attempts to do the same thing to Arathon here in trying to think of something that would send Arathon away so that Arathon cannot find this out because he knows better than Arathon what 
was going to happen and, and what Arathon will likely do, and he needs to protect Arathon from that. So he actually is denying Arathon the agency to decide what to do with this information. And I just love this complexity of emotion and intention and, and how it reflects what we do in our own heads. We say, we don't want people doing these things to us, but we have reasons for doing it to others. And Wurtz doesn't shy away from that. So I hope this has given you a sense of not only how Wurtz writes her stories. Um, I think this is fairly representative of the style that she uses, which is incredibly rich writing that uses a lot of adjectives and a lot of adverbs and description. But each one is carefully chosen that there's a level of intentionality to this writing that if you trust that it is there for a reason, instead of saying, oh, well, this is just overly embellished. The embellishments are not there as decorative pieces. Those words are there to convey additional meaning. And that's not the same as an embellishment. That's communication. And so despite the appearance of it having lots of words. This is very concise writing, but it's in what appears to be a more elaborate style. And it's something I, I very much enjoy. Wurtz uses the range of the English language to convey lots of nuanced meaning, to give the reader connotations that other words would be generally the same, but have slightly different cognitive meaning and implications. And it's just so much fun. But anyway, The Wars of Light and Shadow, uh, it's a fantastic epic fantasy series that I am very much greatly enjoying. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I will see you in the next one.